and there's also bundled up with that there's a lot of stuff around data sovereignty and making sure that you know the people whose stories those are to tell are the ones who control that story mm. and not the people who are writing the technology welcome everyone to a new episode of the zero to play podcast i'm your host carla duke and today i'm joined by Keir rice Keir is a senior tech artist and co-founder of NZXR, a company that creates XR solutions at the intersection of hardware, software, and humans. Today, we'll be talking about the metaverse, Keir's story and game development, and advice he has for us as we slowly enter into a new generation of technology and experiences. So sit back, relax, and enjoy episode 12 of season three of the Zero to Play podcast. Welcome, Keir, to the show. Thanks for joining me. Great to be here. Thanks for having me, Carl. Cool. Uh, I I love that I've got you on the show because uh, I think we've interacted a lot on Twitter. Um, I you know worked with you for a bit at, at Weta Game Shop, uh, Weta Workshop, and uh, I just think you're a good voice for the New Zealand games industry, and you advocate for a lot of really really powerful, really good stuff in the in the industry here in New Zealand. So uh, I'm really grateful to have you on and. I think your perspective on things like the metaverse are really exciting and interesting, and you have some really good points that uh, that I think uh, you'll you know, you you add a really good perspective as someone with with knowledge in the industry um, of you know hardware, uh, the implications of uh, what it could mean, um, and I don't want to go too fluffy uh, with the topic, which I know a lot of people uh, do, uh, but I do want to keep it quite. Um, like rooted in in facts and things like that. Um, so to, to kind of kick off the conversation, um, I, I, I do want to run through your story and everything uh, and how you got into games, but we'll, we'll worry about that a bit later. For now, uh, talking about the metaverse, what um, what is your kind of definition or understanding of it, um, just so that we can kind of get aligned on that same page um, at the beginning? Yeah, sure thing. Uh, so... I mean, first of all, you know, the metaverse as a term uh, has a lot of different meanings. And I probably go back to some of the earlier stuff. Um, like it was coined by, you know, Neil Stevenson back in 92 with his novel Snow Crash. Um, and that's the the meaning that it's kind of stuck with me. It was kind of like a, a, a metaphor of the internet as a physical place. So in the story, you know, the IP address range of the internet was along one axis of a, I think it was a sphere. And the further you traveled down this, down this main road, you know, the further uh, down the IP range you went and there were different places who kind of claimed buildings and things like that, basically internet sites um, popped up along the way. So I think back in 92, you know, nobody was really familiar with the internet the internet wasn't really formed as we know it now and the idea of having this this place kind of enabled the storytelling um which you know it it kind of worked in the book um you know other party people have kind of extended on that as kind of like taking the elements of you have an avatar in a virtual space and you can kind of move around and interact with people around you and i i think that's kind of the the foundation that i've kind of landed on for metaverse yeah, and, uh, and 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 that's kind of a, a good question that that came up when I was when I was doing research on this. So I think like back in '92, I feel like the metaverse was a buzzword back then, and it's kind of only grown since then. But back then, there were mm -hmm. different experiments, different um, pieces of software created. Um, how do you think the perspective of what the metaverse is has changed between you know back then in the '90s to to now? Um, and like, and how technology has has you know answered those questions that people posed back in the nineties. Yeah, sure. I mean, so with any new technology, we always kind of bring the baggage of the past. We try and apply the metaphors and the ideas that we have already onto this new medium, 
as kind of our launching point. And then as we iterate and use it day to day, we kind of realize the strengths and weaknesses of the, the new technology of the new platform and we kind of adapt to these new norms. Uh, so, you know, back at the dawn of the internet, the metaphor for navigating it was, it's a physical place, which kind of made a lot of sense because, you know, how else were you going to find stuff on this place? Search engines didn't exist. Mm. Like Yahoo back in the day was literally, which was, you know, came after the metaverse was coined, was literally the, a hand-built directory, like a, like a yellow pages or a phone book, a, a list of all of the sites on the internet by category because mm. that was feasible. Mm. <laughs> the internet was small enough to do that. Yeah, totally. Um, so as we've kind of grown and realized, I think that we've experimented with the internet as a physical place and it kind of, you don't really need the physicalness of it. Um, it's kind of like having a, a, designing a library on the internet. You wouldn't go and put a rows of shelves everywhere because, you know, there's no need for a book to be in a physical location next to another book you can disconnect the the placement of things. There's no physical dimension. You can just hyperlink to wherever you need to go. You can do search engines. You can do other fancy things to navigate your way around. And the physical metaphor actually, in my view, holds us back in a lot of ways. Mm. You, you retweeted a really, really powerful thread about how storytelling has impacted the topic of the metaverse a lot. You know, making it a physical world is, is really um, interesting and it's visual and people can kind of latch on to that vision but it's not practical and and like you were saying it's not rooted in what's feasible with with technology um, and and I find that really interesting um, it's something that's been discussed is like asynchronous versus synchronous communication mm. um, what are your thoughts on that and where we're kind of at like do you think we need synchronous communication to create a metaverse like experience uh the short answer is yes, I think synchronous is baked into the idea of the metaverse. Um, there's always going to be a place for synchronous communication. I mean, you and me are synchronous right now, like we're yep. interacting and there's a lot of value and it's kind of like a really high bandwidth um, communication channel. Uh, there's a lot of information that flows between us. Uh, but at the same time, you know, that requires a lot of attention. We've got to be focused on each other. We've got to schedule ahead of time. It doesn't scale. I can't be one-on-one -on -one with 10,000 people at the same time. It just doesn't work like that. Mm. Um, so I think synchronous is not going to go away. But in terms of uh, internet communications, I'd say the dominant model for things like social media is definitely asynchronous mm. where you post and people come along later, there's discovery, there's algorithms, there's a chance for curation, all that starts to come in. Um, I would say that uh, looking at something like uh, Clubhouse, which was kind of uh, bubbling along and kind of peaking in the early, early part of 2021, uh, where it was a synchronous kind of communication channel where you, people would go into this clubhouse and, you know, they'd have this real-time chat. But I think they, since then, it's kind of faded away a little bit. I haven't seen a lot of stats on it as such, but I think, like, it, the stats I have seen around kind of, say, app store position, I definitely think it's past its initial kind of booming peak mm -hmm. and it's probably settled into something a bit lower. And there's a lot of issues with uh, discoverability there. Like if you are in a different time zone, mm -hmm. you don't get to hang out with the cool kids unless you want to be up at 3 a.m. Mm -hmm. from New Zealand. Yeah. No, that's that's true. I My experience with Clubhouse it definitely peaked. Um, you know, a lot of people that I followed on Twitter were, were cross posting um, uh, different uh, like sessions that they were having. And I do feel like that's kind of passed and those people aren't, aren't hosting uh, rooms anymore. Um, but you're right. The, the whole virality of it as well is, is hard because it's, it's asynchronous. Um, no, sorry. It's mm. synchronous. So uh, it's, it's hard to, um, you know, in the moment, I think there were a few moments where like Elon Musk maybe jumped into a room and like words spread quite quickly, but it, it wasn't, as viral as what an asynchronous piece of content could be like uh just kind of living 
living online. So yeah, it, it was definitely a cool experiment though to to see the mm. kind of uh, you know solutions that these kind of opportunities can create. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, do do you have do you have any any kind of experiences like that, like a clubhouse example, like a social network or something that you think that you know you've got a, a good strong idea for, but you haven't got the time or resources to create? Is there is there some sort of system that you uh, think would be a solution to that that kind of problem that Clubhouse had? Um, not specifically. Uh, I mean, I'm. I'm the sort of person that uh, I really dig deep, thoughtful posts and I enjoy kind of being able to kind of stop and think about it and uh, write something. So synchronous communication for me is not where I go naturally. Mm -hmm. um, you know, growing up, I wasn't really hanging out in chat rooms. I wasn't really on the phone chatting with my friends a lot. Like I was very much that kind of transactional model of if I'm calling you, it's because I've got some reason to talk to you. We'll do the business and then I'm off again. I'm not, I was never the one to kind of hang around for a couple of hours, just yeah, shooting yeah. the breeze. Small chat. Yeah. I, I understand that a lot of people like the, um, you know, if you're, if you're watching a talk from someone uh, that's like a casual conversation, um, uh, you can, you can grow impatient, I think quite, quite quickly, you know, the value is, 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 is sprinkled throughout like an hour long conversation rather than, you know, a, a headline or an article that's been written and, and planned. And it's definitely a different way of, of, of communicating value, uh, which, which is interesting. Absolutely. You know, uh, the, the, the current trend of uh, all the tutorials moving to online video based things uh, mm -hmm. kind of doesn't really resonate for me. Like I'm the guy who's like, oh, I really wish this was just a page I could skim through and had some nice examples. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But, that, you know, that is different, different people vibe on different styles. So I'm sure there's uh, people out there who it's really working for. Yeah. My, my dream is for every tutorial to be a game like experience i feel like that that's for me the easiest way to get or oh, but but then you know if it is something that you're familiar with like you're saying skimming through you know you don't want to have to play through a tutorial when you already kind of understand the system a little bit um but yeah anyway we're kind of going off track one uh, question mm. i do want to ask uh, about the metaverse was ethics um i i did a i was on a panel with sam uh, ramlu uh, and we're talking about the metaverse and she brought up a really good point about the ethical concerns about wanting to live in a fully virtual world all the time. And I thought that that was really powerful. And I think any discussion that involves the metaverse should talk about ethics and like how far should we go, even if we can, like, what is, what does that boundary look like? What are your thoughts on, on kind of the discussions about the metaverse and taking it too far? Uh, so in terms of taking it too far, like to me, like in, in popular media, you'd look to something like the matrix as the logical extension, right? It's people in a vat who don't even know the real world exists because they're so deeply in a, in a, in a virtual world. Um, that doesn't really worry me so much because I feel like that's so impossibly far off that I'm not really it's not even on my radar. Um, for me, it's, I'm much more interested in the kind of the grounding of the here and the now around um, equitable access to um, places like this. Like, what does it mean if you need a subscription to get onto these places? Mm. Um, and, you know, what it mean, ends up meaning if we look to something like uh let's say the world of warcraft model where you have world of warcraft at one end where there's online communities of people who are jumping in and playing and arguably they are in a virtual universe it's not kind of vr based it's not full body haptics or anything but i think it still counts and then you kind of end up with these ecosystems of um other games using different models going down so at the other end of it, you'd have something like, uh, say, RuneScape, which is kind of World of Warcraft-like, but free-to-play, browser-based, um, 
and there's kind of like this transition of people with the money can afford the big subscription people who can't uh do diff use the other models which are free to play and it's probably ad driven attention based kind of economies and then there's people who just straight up miss out because they don't have the devices to even enter that kind of space mm -hmm. so you know there's there's a lot of kind of layers of uh, inequality in a society reflected there where it becomes critically important to me is if you start doing things like putting civil functions into these spaces, say your Wellington City Council, and you've done a LIDAR scan of the entire city and created a digital twin model and hooked up all your Internet of Things devices, and suddenly this, uh, this tool that you've built now has a lot of information, a lot of power, and people who are able to jump in and interact with that or able to kind of digest information presented in that context now have a different different access to information than somebody who's not comfortable in that space. Um, so there's a lot of ethics around making sure that that information is still available in other mediums, like through websites or offline. Like, honestly, like the transition to online services at the moment is probably that's where the battle needs to happen now rather than in the metaverse side because all of those same kind of inequalities are going to exist online first before we kind of transition to metaverse type things so you know making sure that we get good um, structures in place now will serve us well in terms of templates for the metaverse mm -hmm. um, and there's all sorts of other um, interesting things around you know the rights of sorry, the responsibilities of things like making sure you, that you can archive your records properly. Like that's a big problem in the gaming industry is how do you archive an online multiplayer game, right? Mm. Like, um, and, you know, places like the Wellington City Council uh, are trying to grapple with that. Like how do you archive a version of a data set which is, you know, sprawling and linked out to all sorts of disparate services? Mm. Yeah, no, that's that's really um, that's true. There's there's some really big challenges there. Do you do you feel like mobile devices are at a stage that you can you can kind of accept everyone has one, or do you think we still need to think of solutions to to make that a true a true like fact? Um, you know how 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 um, commonplace mobile mobile devices are now. Do you think that that's a a good place to start with with things that everyone has access to yeah i mean it's there's kind of this law of big numbers right like you could say that 99 percent of the population has a mobile phone device i just made up that number but yeah. let's go with it in a city of a million people like that's what let me make sure i do my maths right a thousand <laughs> that's, you know, thousand the, or ten thousand i think that's ten thousand right that's ten thousand people who don't have a device 10,000 people is a lot of people mm. it's one percent but it's also a lot of people so you've got to be really careful when you're kind of thinking about arguments like this mm. and you know what happens if I drop my phone and smash it and I've got no phone for till the repair comes in or till I can pay day and I can afford a new phone or you know whatever like there's always it's not just the systemic kind of oh, the 1% of people who don't have it is also what percentage of my life am I going to be without a phone through mm -hmm. circumstance? And suddenly you find that actually 50% of people are going to have not have a phone for a small percentage of their life. Mm -hmm. And it, the equality solutions that we come up to support the 1% who can't or don't have the capacity or the resources to have a phone also support people who are temporarily out of out of uh, digital contact with the rest of the world mm -hmm. so i think it's still important that we kind of follow down those paths and make sure that we are equitable and it helps all of us totally yeah i mean that's a really really good topic i think not not talking about the metaverse anymore but just talking about the internet of things um and and i'd love to get someone from from like a council or at a government level uh that is really passionate about uh you know this future of tech and and the kind of challenges 
that they have things like that um but i wonder if you can if you can pair it with you know homelessness and, and things like that which you know do have uh you know there's still issues that are being dealt with in like a physical at a physical level and i wonder at a government level at what point they kind of uh accept the majority of the population being in a certain circumstance um i am definitely yeah. not the right person <laughs> to be talking about that stuff but it's it's really cool to uh, think about and um, maybe i can get an expert one day to to help um one other question i had about uh the metaverse is avatars uh do you personally mm. think that avatars are needed um to to i don't know make i mean we've we've spoken about a lot of things but but what are your thoughts on on just avatars in general and the 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 journey people are making to make those as lifelike as as possible uh to me lifelike as possible is such a an art direction choice and the type of experience that you want that like okay if you want to make your experience lifelike go for it that's fine yeah um in terms of like an avatar like you know people enjoy doing dress ups like and having people uh enter an ex a game experience and create a character and pour some of themselves into this character is a great tool in terms of you know both the players getting enjoyment out of it you know my daughter uh loves going in and like we play pokemon go as a family but probably her favorite part of it is she likes to go and try on all the outfits for all the for all the things. And if you she's playing on your phone, your character's going to have a different look by the time you come back. Yeah. And you know, that's fine. She's enjoying it at whatever level she wants to enjoy it at. Um, in addition to that, like when people do pour themselves into these characters, that is kind of an investment of time and personality. And I think definitely helps with things like retention. So I think it's a, a good thing to put in. Where it intersects with the metaverse is really interesting because often there's this kind of idea that you should have a metaverse avatar, which is then able to cross boundaries between games. So if you look at something like uh, Ready Player One by mm -hmm. Ernest Klein, uh, that was very much the thing of like you go to, you create your character and then you go to different worlds and your character kind of persists persists across worlds um but that's kind of for me uh, i really struggle with this like understanding the boundary between what a, what a metaverse is in that scenario if we map it onto our games now like is fortnite a metaverse because there's different game modes mm. like if i go to an ariana concert versus a battle royale like is that now a metaverse thing Mm. Or should I be able to take my Fortnite character across to Roblox and play over there? Mm. But then like stylistically, it doesn't map, the systems don't map. So mm. how do you kind of manage that thing? I mean, likewise, if I create a, you know, level 60 sword in, or, you know, earn a sword in, say, uh, World of Warcraft, should I then be able to take that across to Minecraft and use it there? Like, what does mm. that even mean to... Yeah the games are designed the, yeah exactly they're designed in an ecosystem and in a standalone way so yeah it's really weird i mean i've heard some people describe uh games are to the metaverse what a web page is to the internet mm. and if you go by that definition does that mean my steam library is the metaverse mm. Yeah, Does that yeah. mean my profile picture and my kind of like list of friends and my community is the metaverse component for my Steam library? Maybe. Mm. I think the closest is probably something like on Xbox with like a multiplayer team party where it's like you've gathered a group of friends, you have your avatar, you're in live chat, and you can bounce this party between multiple games and kind of stick together. Like That sounds pretty close to me. Mm but it's still kind of self-contained. It's not like uh, the internet where it's like, I jump around to different websites. Um, but 
yeah, it's fine to jump around to different websites and have different profile pictures on each and different logins. And there's a whole other rabbit hole that we probably want to skip around of, on the name wars and all that sort of stuff as well, yeah. managing different identities. Yeah, no, uh, you, I think you touched on it enough for us to know that there's more questions that need to be asked. Um, but but uh, those are really, really good examples. Um, definitely. And, and I think looking at how the internet's currently structured is, is a good start, I think, to see how the, you know, how the perspective, there, there isn't some magical thing that will be created that will you know everyone will start porting over to i think it's going to be a gradual change just like how the internet's evolved over the last 20 years it's going to be a, a gradual thing as people discover the tools and and try different things and and figure it out together um as a yeah. you know as a society so something else to jump in on on that topic is around kind of like ownership and control of a metaverse like what does that even mean? If you have a look at somebody like Facebook, who's, you know, the they've got Oculus, they're heavy in on VR, they're looking at, you know, VR work, Zuckerberg's looking at VR workplaces by 2030, they're looking, exploring, doing ads in VR, like, they're all in, they want to be the metaverse and kind of the town square of the digital world and VR, right? Like, they've got 10,000 engineers working on this stuff today mm. and if you add up the number like what's the average salary for a silicon valley engineer times ten thousand, that's that's a pretty big bet right there mm. so like facebook's all in on this kind of idea of being the metaverse but can a company be the metaverse or are they just averse yeah <laughs> like if you have more than one metaverse like what does that even mean? Like, if they're not interoperable? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you're you're absolutely right. Uh, I, you you made a tweet. I think that said, if if uh, if a company tries to create the metaverse, then they're just a universe. They're not. They're not this whole meta approach of yeah, like you were saying, some something that uh, that is like the internet. Uh, unless unless Facebook are conscious of that and are prepared to create. Uh, an infrastructure that is completely open and you know but I, I feel like that's the that's the argument that uh tim sweeney uh at epic yeah. is, is is making uh compared to some of these other companies when they talk about the metaverse yeah i mean tim sweeney is on record in their um, lawsuit with apple is saying they're not a game company they're a metaverse company and they've taken funding on the order of a billion dollars to kind of push in that direction um so I would agree that they they are very much competing in that Facebook space of, you know, have have an experience where people can come and hang out with their friends and do some things. And I feel like they're very much on the uh, from the game side of things. They're coming in. They've got a lot of content. They're looking around. They're taking uh, the battle royal for, format. They're taking the um, oh sorry imposters what's mm -hmm. the game among us yeah among us taking the among us format and kind of rolling it in and keeping it going um then you've got somebody like roblox who is coming at it from the game side but user generated content where the users are providing all the content and kind of flicking through and then you've got facebook from the social media side of things coming in and trying to so there's this convergent point where they're all trying to race to be a metaverse but mm. i don't know It'd be interesting to see how it lands Definitely. Uh, is there anything else regarding the metaverse that you wanted to touch on uh, before we move on? Because uh, there's other things uh, I do. Want I, to I will just I will just jump back to a point you had there about maybe Facebook will open up and provide access and you know ways for others to link in. Um, I would, uh, if you're considering going down that path, have a look at uh, Facebook Gaming and how that played out. <laughs> uh, it's. It's probably not a a solid. It's probably a good short term strategy and a poor long term strategy to go into bed with Facebook in that style. In today's supporter segment, I'd like to bring attention to Logitech, Logitech Gaming, and Blue Microphones. Thanks to them, they sent me a product bundle that has just elevated the content of this podcast and show. Uh, as you can see, the video quality is incredible now. They sent me a uh, Logitech Stream Cam. 
Uh, for audio, they sent a Blue Yeti microphone. I already had one, but now I have two, which will enable me to do in-person interviews and other things like that. And also they provided this Logitech Gaming uh, Pro X headset to uh, have as just a, a great pair of headphones to use uh, for the podcast. But honestly, I'm going to use it for my own personal work and uh, and games as well. So really appreciative of them. Uh, go check them out on their, on their website, logitech.com. Uh, bluemicrophones.com and I think Logitech G or Logitech Gaming uh, you can find them on social media and uh, yeah I'm just really grateful for them and uh, please support their products I mean looking at how the internet was created I am not uh, tech like I haven't done research in that area but I'd, I'd be interested to know how that did actually come about um, and and you know the if, if coming at it from a corporate perspective is, is the right or wrong way um, but yeah, yeah, um, that's definitely some some heavy conversations we've had at NZXR around uh, the coming kind of ubiquity of mixed reality devices like headsets, Hololens, Magic Leap, um, the Snap Glasses, things like that. Like, what does it mean if we now have anchored virtual content layered on the real world? So this is kind of uh, touching on a different facet of the metaverse some people are using the term metaverse i don't think it fits but it's kind of like we have the real world how do we bring the internet and layer it on top of the real world how do we give the internet a location-based dimension uh and there's a whole bunch of issues around kind of the infrastructure for how do you even address content in that world? How do you layer it up? Who gets ownership? Who decides what the default layer is? Do property rights exist? There's this massive can of worms, which we're mm -hmm. um, definitely interested in exploring at NZXR and mm -hmm. you know, having some good conversations around that in terms of making sure that we try and bring our New Zealand perspective to that and try and avoid the come at it from very much the opposite end of the kind of Silicon Valley ad revenues, surveillance-based uh, business models and come at it more from a uh, an open source, let's make this good and something we can be proud of. Mm -hmm. Totally. Um, LBEs is a word that like location-based experiences is, is a word that that is thrown around a bit in this space. Is that is that a mm -hmm. term that you, uh, you, you use often that you like? Um, when talking about these kinds of things uh for me they kind of location-based experiences imply that there's some sort of physical infrastructure to support it mm. uh that's probably just a bias and a hang-up i have um but we are very much about yeah our stuff is a location-based experience um we've developed a framework for kind of dropping content at a specific gps location and to be able to kind of have multiple devices at the moment we're using um, cell phones with you know kind of ar pass through video ar um, having multiple people in the same experience at the same time seeing the same content and being able to interact and play with each other mm -hmm. and then kind of you know walk down the road to the next kind of segment linking stuff together maybe it's a historical walk trail maybe it's a, an arts festival piece maybe it's a, a, a a tour through a bushwalk, you know, identifying some of the natural plants. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's uh, um, somebody from your from your Papa kind of, you know, talking through some of the stories that they've heard as they kind of walk around the area, like tying information to places and kind of is something that we're really interested in. Mm -hmm. And there's also bundled up with that there's a lot of stuff around data sovereignty and making sure that you know the people whose stories those are to tell are the ones who control that story mm. and not the people who are writing the technology yeah that's really really good point as well to end on i think ethics with all of these topics are uh, are important to to have as as a um, a pillar of, of, you know, all the experimentation that's happening in the space. Um, so yeah, you've already, you've spoken about NZXR a little bit. Um, a lot of the clients that you guys work with, are, um, you know, you, you probably can't talk about a lot of the projects, but, um, I want to kind of talk about your game dev journey 
up until now, like you're a senior tech artist, tech art I've, I've kind of learned as, as the, the person in, um, in, in, the, in the development team that is, is, understands the technology, but also understands the, the art pipeline. And is at the end of the day, someone that has way too much responsibility on their shoulders. Um, so I'd love to know how you got into tech art, like how your journey into game development started and what brought you to mixed reality and wanting to pursue that as a, as a career. Cool thing. Uh, so very early on, I decided that what I really wanted to do as a career was to make imaginary things real. And I'd kind of assumed that that would lead me into a movie special effects with a digital type um, space. At the time when I was thinking about this, uh, Lord of the Rings was kind of just starting to be in production and I just started reading the books and I'm like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. Um, and I kind of started my journey, went through school, went to design school at Massey University in Wellington and studied animation um, and digital media design. Um, and along the way, I found that I didn't really have the patience for uh, putting in enough time to get that mastery of animation and things like that. And I found the workaround that I used was to script everything. So if it wasn't right, I would change the script and rerun it and until I was perfectly happy with it and it was reproducible. Um, and that kind of suited my personality a lot. So I ended up going through that program and my final project was a study on an animation rig, like how to design the user interface for animation rigs, um, which ended up being an awful lot of coding for, uh, for an art degree, but there you go. Um, uh, once I finished that, uh, I kind of bummed around a bit, um, slept off a lot of burnout, uh, and eventually when I kind of came out of it, I found that, um, she interactive was hiring for a technical artist. Um, so I went and applied and I was fortunate enough to get the job. Um, shout out for my friends who were, I had a couple of friends who were there who were, you know, prodding me in that direction and forcing me to actually apply instead of, uh, endlessly working on my show reel until it was perfect. So that was very much appreciated. <laughs> um, so I arrived at, at she and they just, they had had a technical artist who was this amazing wizard coder who was, uh, you know, helping optimize the games and doing shader code and writing systems and just, uh, you know, super experienced person. And they had left to go and uh, pursue other things. So there were, I was the sole technical artist at, she and I kind of sat down and said, oh, cool, what do you want me to do? And they said, well, what can you do? <laughs> um, so at that point they knew that they were missing having a technical artist, but um, so kind of working with uh, Tyrone McCauley um, a lot, who was my boss then, um, kind of like worked it out together, what gaps I could fill in the process. And um, before I knew it, they uh, uh, hired uh, Julian to come and join. So there were, the, two of us and we kind of trained each other up and learned all about it. And, um, I ended up spending, uh, eight years, I think, um, I was there through the transition to pickpock and wow. ended up working on, you know, 50 plus titles across my time there. Wow. Um, that's a lot of yeah, titles. But, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, I say worked on because I'm a technical artist. I support in multiple teams at a time. So it would be the sort of thing where I'd swoop in and help them out with solving problems or, you know, making sure that the, the underlying tool set was kind of in the right place. Um, yeah, lots of discussions and lots of kind of being the glue between art and tech and making sure that people were speaking the same language and, mm -hmm. and translating. Um, along the way, I ended up, taking on a bunch of analytics work. And uh, before I left, I was actually analytics manager for a while. So for a couple of years, I helped build up that side of things um, because there was a gap and uh, they were good enough to kind of uh, support me in kind of filling that and uh, learning some things about data processing and making pretty dashboards and graphs. Yeah, so that's more like uh, UX, UX skills, right? A little bit, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, for me, it was uh, kind of 
digging in and trying to learn something new because I felt like I'd, I'd done a lot in the technical art space and there was kind of this big open area of analytics where we didn't have anybody who was kind of actively addressing that role. Like it was something we knew we needed, but didn't really know how to start. So hmm. it was kind of one of those things where I was kind of pitching in and helping out on my, we had lab days, which were like, you know, once a month you get to go and do something. So I spent a few lab days kind of skilling up and trying to uh, automate some of the things and it kind of snowballed from there. So how did you go from, uh, how did you go f- uh, from pickpock to, to Weta? Uh, so uh, I had a few friends over there who I knew were working on uh, super secret, interesting tech and uh, they wouldn't tell me what they were working on. And I was watching the Magic League goes and I'm like I want to go play with all shiny toys uh and I was fortunate that they needed a technical artist uh they put out an ad so I jumped at the chance and um went to went to play with magic leap devices and I uh, spent I think three or four years there helping the team grow and kind of I was in the transition point from kind of early research through into all right now we actually need to make a game and ship a game Mm -hmm. which is uh, quite a different skill set from being early research and into no actually we need production processes and producers and all that that good stuff so yeah and then you guys you you guys developed and and shipped uh dr Grodbots, which uh from people on the other side of the world that are in the ar space have have um uh, hailed the i don't know if hailed is the right word but just celebrated how much of a um great experience that was to showcase ar technology um even to this day which is awesome i can see for those watching the video that they're, they're wearing a, a dr girl shirt um which is, <laughs> I which am is indeed. Awesome. um that's that's really cool and then so about a year ago uh, at the beginning or midway through 2021 um magic leap did some restructuring and uh and this is what i'm really fascinated about um a, a bunch of the the devs from uh from where to workshop ended up leaving and forming nzxr can you talk a bit about that and the team on yeah. that and what you guys are kind of doing there as much as you can talk about sure thing uh so the where to workshop magic leap thing was a bit of a partnership where there was i think 15 of us were kind of magic leap employees uh paid by magic leap but working at Weta Workshop and a lot of the art and production team uh, and later on some of the devs as well were Weta Workshop employees or contractors. So there was kind of like this, uh, this kind of coalition of us just working together, like um, that relationship between Magic Leap and Weta Workshop actually predates Magic Leap. Like Roni, who's the founder, was down working on some other projects with Weta Workshop before he started Magic Leap. So there was a, wow. an extremely strong tie there. Um, and there's a lot of trust and a lot of kind of um, helping shape the vision. There was a lot of early stuff around concept and kind of helping steer the wider company and the wider team uh, towards a, a direction of here's the end goal of the like the vision that Roni had to be able to communicate that effectively. Um, and we got to kind of pursue that all the way through to launching Dr. Grogbots. Um, so that kind of leads up to, you know, May 2020, uh, Magic Leap itself, uh, they, this is the start of the pandemic and they basically, I think they got credit crunch, like they were operating on, uh, there's a lot of fundraising coming in, a lot of capital raising and with the pandemic on, all of that capital dried up. And I think they let go on the order of a thousand people um, and closed studios all around the world. Uh, And unfortunately uh, we were not spared. So the, the Weta workshop side of things uh, um, is still exists. Weta game shop is still going Mm -hmm. um, and they've got lots of exciting things in, in the works, but it was definitely a brutal period because, you know, basically that team got ripped in half all of the, 
I made it let people uh, were made redundant. We were in the middle of lockdown. We didn't get to say goodbye to anybody because wow. we were all at home. Yeah, yeah. So there was this thing and we were, you know, hanging out on a conference call to hear the news from the other side of the world. We knew all our colleagues in uh, Florida, you know, whole teams had been let go. And we were sitting here waiting to hear what would happen with us. And then all of the, the complexities of, uh, trying to make sure that uh, this American company knew the rules of redundancy for New Zealand and followed process. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So there's all of that going on. Um, wow. So of the, I think 14, 15 of us, um, 10 of us decided that we were going to uh, stick together and try and make a go of it. I mean, basically we decided that we hadn't finished. Mm. There was a lot of ideas we still had on the table and we started shopping ourselves around as like, hey, here's a unit of devs who have got, you know, eight years of experience playing with a technology that's only been out for two years. <laughs> um, yep. Hey, look, we've got this cool, shiny Dr. Grodbots thing. Um, and there's plenty of other companies in this space who are, you know, eyeing up this kind of this mm -hmm. thing. So we basically made the short list of, you know, who are the companies we really want to work for? Who are the companies we really want to avoid? And let's work our contacts and see what happens. Um, turned out that we didn't get hired on, on mass and we were kind of pitching everything from, Hey, you should start a New Zealand studio. Here's the team through to like, you know, what cool projects have you got uh, for us to work on? Um, and across the time like we've managed to kind of keep together we've um kept a roof over everybody's head uh worked on everything from like vr education titles through to like hololens projects and kind of medical and physiotherapy environments through to uh prototypes for mobile ar games um various uh we say hardware manufacturers have we've reached out and worked with um we're all working with so it's really we've been really fortunate there's a who's who of the industry has uh been knocking on our door to get us to help out oh. um one thing that really worked in our advantage was with the scale of the layoffs a thousand people in the mixed reality space it's like a seed bomb that just went throughout mm -hmm. the entire industry. Mm -hmm. So there are contacts everywhere <laughs> yeah. um, that we can lean on and who we've worked with in the past. So um, the amount of knowledge that uh, kind of spread out from Magic Leaf is just immense. Mm -hmm. And I think I don't, I would almost use the word net positive, but I don't want to go that far, but you know, <laughs> it's a, uh, it's definitely not a negative thing to have that experience and knowledge kind of spread out and taking root in other companies to to help grow our our brand new medium. Yeah. So I, I think it's awesome that you've worked on so many different types of experiences um, on different devices and things like that. Are you kind of yearning for a big project um, in a space? Like, do you still feel like it's maturing? It's, it's still very early stage and you're, you're kind of waiting for that breakthrough so that you can really lean into a project for the long term or do you quite like the the environment of jumping from um you know client to client and working on different problems for different uh different working on solutions to different problems that's that's a question we had to do a bunch of soul searching about um especially when somebody uh dangles a big check and says hey here's a here's a big project that's going to be you know you're going to have to stand up a team and multiple years to ship it to consumers and it's kind of like mm -hmm. wow that like that's something we could totally do but at the same time you know we're having a lot of fun jumping around from project to project and mm. a lot of people are giving us all the fun prototyping to do so yeah Let's, let's let's just keep surfing this prototyping for a while and um yeah we, let's try and you know find the right team to for this other project which is an amazing opportunity but it's just not right for us so yeah um 
Yeah. Do you, uh, when, when talking about selling something to consumers, uh, you know, making a decision if you want to commit to several years to a project is one thing, but in terms of the state of the, the industry, um, do you think it's we're ready for consumer products to be uh, really pushed through? Like from your perspective, do you think it's 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 time? Is there enough? Uh, are there enough users for you know XR technology to um, warrant a long term project like that? In the mobile space, yes. Mm. Yeah, like like Pokemon Go, make right? That work. Yeah. Exactly. So if you look at someone like Niantic, uh, mm. they've got Pokemon Go and they've got other, other yeah, projects that they're, that they're working on, um, both released and unreleased, that I think are going to do interesting things. Mm. Like they've got a whole ecosystem there. They've got their, uh, I think it's called Lightship, is their kind of like a uh, layer of magic which they're trying to distill out and... Um, get other studios to come in and uh, work with them. Mm -hmm. um, you've got people like Snap with their kind of Snap Lens studio and things like that uh, doing amazing technological stuff on mobile. And I think there's going to be some really interesting things there around how they extend that out into kind of more game-like experiences. Mm. Um, so on the mobile side, absolutely. Uh, on the hardware side with Magic Leap or HoloLens, not yet. Mm. I think we're still, we're too big. The hardware itself, I think, is still too big. Um, I don't think we're going to get there until we get the fashion aspect of it locked in mm. and the practicalities of battery life. Uh, most of these devices are not able to do a full day's wear at the moment. Mm -hmm. And they're certainly kind of at a weight where you know if you're wearing the unit, right? It's not like a pair of, of glasses. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, snaps with their glasses are kind of heading down that direction. They're much closer to that kind of regular pair of glasses form factor. But the battery life... Hours, I think, maybe an hour. Um, right. So I think uh, give, give it 10 years and we'll we'll chat again about how we're going yeah totally I, i'm super excited about it this stuff is so cool yeah i, I think it's it was incredible seeing um snapchat like like you know snap incorporated and the kind of uh innovations that they're making in the ar space I, like and you know they made that really really early on and it was a it was a big gamble and it still is and and i'm fascinated by just how um, I can't remember the name of the the CEO, but um, his vision of you know what the future could be, and and just seeing the things coming out of Snap Inc. That's not from a social media perspective. I I find yeah really fascinating to watch as well. Um, yeah, I mean in terms of uh, that technology, like they actually went out to the marketplace and acquired a company to do that. Like they can see it on the horizon as oh this is an opportunity. And I think they dropped on the order of you know hundred million dollars to buy that. Wow. Uh, yeah, I think I'm checking my notes. I think it was about 2013, 2014. They spent a hundred million dollars to acquire a company which uh, was the foundations for their like face tracking lens tech. Wow. And then they've just really run run with it from there. Yeah. I mean now they're doing full body bone tracking, segmentation of t-shirts, face tracking, the background removal, the whole lot. And just a really engaged community around it, making lenses. It's, it's good to see. Yeah, that's awesome. Uh, I, I I wish we had more time to kind of, yeah, go into the details of, of the exact like technological advancements that companies like Snap are, are making. But, uh, but I do think we've covered some really good um, topics that, you know, if people are curious, they can, they can go dig deeper into them and um, I, I do really appreciate you coming on. Uh, if anyone's interested in, in following Keir, you can find him on Twitter at uh, Keir Rice, K-E-I-R-R-I-C-E. -E. Um, and I think on, on LinkedIn as well. Um, yeah, yep, I, I, I'm around. <laughs> I, 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 love, uh, I love your content just because it, it comes from a really wholesome, uh, positive space and someone that's so uh, deep in, in the technological aspects of, of 
you know, the, the future and just understanding of the technology. Um, I, I really love seeing your perspective as innovations uh, are coming up because I think they, they're going to impact everyone's lives. So definitely go check out Kia and, um, and, and follow his content. Um, yeah, thank you so much for telling us your story and how you got into the space. I think that's really inspiring for people to hear as well. And, uh, and yeah, is there anything, any last piece of kind of advice or note that you'd like to uh, end, end the show on? Yeah, I'd probably end just by saying, like, I think what excites me most about the kind of mixed reality metaverse space at the moment is it feels like we are at the very beginning of a new medium. And the social norms and rules and conventions around the medium haven't been formed yet. It's like 1920s cinema, like we're still inventing it as we go along. And there's still such a massive opportunity to shape things in a positive direction, which, you know, really keeps me going. So come, come hang out, join us, make the future. Awesome. Reach out to NZXR if you've got any, any cool prototyping um, uh, product projects that you want a, a talented team to get behind. Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's awesome. Thank you for your time. And I wish you a good rest of your day. Thanks, Carl. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the Zero to Play podcast. I hope you learned something about game development, the games industry as a whole, or the future of games. You can follow us on Twitter at Zero to Play, subscribe to us on YouTube, follow us on Spotify, or any other podcasting service. Other than that, you can find links to this episode down in the description below, and I'll see you guys next week for the next episode.